I wrote Apple Seed in the late 1990s, prior to the First Nations Land Management Act coming into force. I had not yet engaged in providing advice directly to Indigenous nations having treaties with the Crown, which began a couple of years later. I had dealt with treaties on the Crown side, Federal Government of Canada and the Territorial Government of the Northwest Territories. In between, I acted as in-house legal counsel for the West Bank Indian Band of the Okanagan Interior Salish, Interior of British Columbia. The first, uh, to my knowledge, to act in-house for an Indian band in Canada, my client was the band, not the band council, and Robert Louis was the chief counselor. How could I ever forget that after Tom Lindley, then unknown to me, and son of the late chief Norman Lindley, West Bank Indian Band's first chief, came bursting into my office, really pissed off, only a couple of feet of desk between us. No one else was around. I did not know what would happen next. He shouted at me, who is your client? He was giving me that evil eye. I thought it was obvious. Uh, the band, I said, in that slow, drawn out way you might address an unbalanced character. He nodded at me and said, good, and was gone. During my time living among Interior Salishan, elders of various communities, the knowledge and history carriers, the medicine people identified me. They just started asking me to come by or arriving on my doorstep, some waiting patiently for me to get home from a road trip. This increased the more gatherings I found myself at. More and more at such gatherings, they would draw me near and dismiss others. It was not comfortable as the others were clearly displeased I was talking with their elders. Very early on, an elder engaging me together with other elders looked toward the door, stopped mid-thought, and began to shake uncontrollably. I was, of course, alarmed, a seizure or something, but he was staring at that hall entrance so strangely. Are you okay? I asked him. He could not speak, but he eventually brought his eyes back to me. It's just the black, she explained, one of the elders we were sitting with. The black, I asked. I looked over and saw a man wearing a long black overcoat had just come in. The elders remained eerily silent and still. The man with the long coat kept walking in our direction, came nearby, and then went through the kitchen door and out the back. It reminded me of that young moose I had seen munching something delicious close by the bush road, only a couple of feet from me, ducking into the nearest bush a few steps ahead and standing absolutely still. He had noticed me far too late to do anything about it. His eye catching mine, he looked down, hoping I really had not seen him and that I would just go away and leave him alone. I laughed hard out loud. He perked his head up and we shared a good long look with me smiling large. Then he casually moved out and trotted on his way with a last look back at me. His gift was not of his flesh that day. That man upsets you, I asked. It was as if he had come back from somewhere else, some light returned to his eyes. He looked down at the floor, I waited. Others took deep breaths. It's not the man, it's just when, well, you see, black robes. Can't help myself. He choked on those last words. It's all right, she comforted him. It's like that for us too. She doesn't need to know. Yeah, she probably wouldn't never believe me anyhow, he said. Of course I would believe you, I rather rudely interrupted. This was a man sharing so much and for whom I had the greatest of respect. None of this was making any sense. The lawyer and me had to know. He looked at me, at the others, trying to decide. I'm going to tell her, he finally said. Their gasps unnerved me. He took a deep breath and sat up taller. We never told nobody about it. No one white would believe it, he began. He took another deep breath. He finished the details of what happened in residential school at the hands of the black robed priests. Abuse is just not strong enough a word. It took all I had not to throw up. I looked at him. You believe me, he was genuinely surprised. He turned to the others, she believes me. It was their turn to be in shock. This is why in my 1990s book mentioned below, I say clearly, 
I believe you. And that it starts there at these residential schools. Appleseed 2.0 is because it has not ended. They all told me and many more since. I have never been the same. I will never forget his eyes, that pure raw fear triggered by the sight of a long black coat. I thought back to all I had read from files and materials while trying to prepare myself to properly engage my new duties as Department of Justice in-house legal counsel for the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, an area of law completely foreign to me, having come over from Revenue Canada taxation, customs and excise. Why? What was so important that such things would be done to children? There were still pieces missing from that puzzle. I set out to find them. Often they were shown to me. An irrational sense to walk down a certain aisle in a certain law library, pull out a certain law report and open it to a certain page, and then being astonished because there would have been no way for me to have found that case or reference in the normal course of legal research. Then questioning, why had the references to those sources been culled from the standard legal research tools? The plot thickened. I was still pretty young in the ways of the Indian industry. And I was acting on the naive presumption that, like I had come to understand from the elders, all Indigenous leaders and old people, how can I put this, believed, old Indigenous people not necessarily being elders, believed in what the ancestors carried on, believed in their people, believed in the fundamental Indigenous laws of caring, sharing, loving, believed in improving their nations in Canada by acting to remove racism and discrimination and correcting the path of nation to nation diplomatic relations. Many cannot see that the path has been laid for them by the hunters, content to enjoy the few tasty morsels set out for them. Later, Her Majesty's government, with a huge weak spot in the paper trail, got that plugged when handed the opportunity by the residential school class action litigation. Since that was an adversarial process, there was no duty owed by Crown lawyers to anyone or anything other than the instructions they received for government interests. Everyone else seemed to focus on money. Who focused on the children, the nations, the broken laws, the betrayal, the killing of the Indian and the man? A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one and that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. We make our greatest mistake in feeding our civilization to the Indians instead of feeding the Indians to our civilization. America has different customs and civilizations from Germany. What would be the result of an attempt to plant American customs and civilization among the Germans in Germany, depend, demanding that they shall become thoroughly American before we admit them to the country? Now, what we have all along attempted to do for and with the Indians is just exactly that and nothing else. We invite the Germans to come into our country and communities and share our customs, our civilization to be of it. And the result is immediate success. Why not try it on the Indians? The school at Carlisle is an attempt on the part of the government to do this. Carlisle has always planted treason to the tribe and loyalty to the nation at large. It has preached against colonizing Indians and in favor of individualizing them. This is from the official report of the 19th Annual Conference of Charities and Corrections, dated 1892, reprinted in Richard H. Pratt, The Advantages of Mingling Indians with Whites. And that was printed, uh, that was 1880 to 1900, and comes out of Harvard University Press, 1973, pages 260 to 271. And there we have the FNLMA regime and other federal opt-in initiatives, fresh from a paper read by the founder of the American flagship, 1879 to 1918, Indian Boarding School, the Carlisle from Pennsylvania Indian Industrial School. Captain Richard H. Pratt at an 1892 convention 
titled Kill the Indian and Save the Man. And quite frankly, there we have Canadian law schools too. At these Salish and gatherings and meetings, torn between the threatening looks of others and respecting this was not my place, and the insistence of the elders, I would sit with them. People had been talking about some unusual things, none of it making much sense to me at the time. Like coming into my office, and as we were discussing something outside my window, they saw different animals come out one by one to stand beside each other in a line, as if to listen to our conversation. And an Indigenous person said, that person then leaving very wide-eyed, seeming a bit spooked, saying, those animals are never together like that. They never do that. This is very important. A big city gal, I did not know anything about the animals of the area. Why some of those animals were not scared of the others did seem strange, but it was just so cool to see them all. As for all those looks at me, well, I was new. Maybe I was just not what some expected, not being an older white male. Later, I was asked to come to an area central to the interior Salishan, a place I had not been before with very vague instructions, not even having an actual place to then follow someone to the meeting or even a set time. I got there when I got there that day. There has always been this thing called Switlow time my friends had teased me about for a long time. I am driving around feeling apprehensive and just about to head back home thinking this is crazy when sure enough I bump into who I needed to, at least I assumed as much because he seemed to expect me. Off we go on a rather roundabout drive, eventually, and I'm wondering why the few blocks required the yellow brick road treatment and why the rush to get inside, I entered into a large hall. It is filled with elders sitting in a large circle, most of whom I had not seen before. Very old elders. I became excited. I'd be able to listen to what they would be sharing. I made for an empty chair along against the wall. Admonished, I was moved to within the circle, close to the doorway. Some elders were made to shift to make room. Their helpers were visibly annoyed at this. More looks. It began in their language, as was usual, but then it stopped and one gestured toward me and all heads turned my way. Then the beckoning wave with the unspoken come up, come up. I point at myself in query. It is confirmed I am to go up there. I am standing in front of them all. Now I'm never shy before an audience, but this was a circle of, did I say it, really old elders. There had always been elders at gatherings and meetings I had been to, but this was the first all-elder circle I had seen. No politicians. I'm standing there having no idea why. It becomes all too much for one young helper. She screams out in protection of her elders. Get her out of here. What is she doing here? We can't have this white woman here, not with these elders. Heavy emphasis on this white. So I start on my way happily, if I can still find a seat along the wall, like I first thought appropriate. I did not want to leave, though. I had been invited, and I wanted to listen. What happened next? Well, all hell broke loose. It startled me. Who knew such old elders could be so fierce? The man who had led me to the hall was beside me. He held my arm, stopping me from leaving. The young woman who spoke with the center of the fury, and she grew very red and hung her head. She was forced to apologize to me, then she was sent away. Her elder then spoke with the others, seeming to be apologizing to them. Then after their murmurs and nods in English, that elder requested my forgiveness. I was so confused. What was the wrongdoing that required apology? I, I just nodded back. Then who appeared to be the most elder elder, the boss elder, the one who first opened up on that young helper, she explained to me in English that they had invited me there that they were most embarrassed by this young one's behavior towards me, that it was unacceptable. I just looked around. Realizing they were waiting on me, I said, it's okay. They seemed relieved, and I started to make my way back from the circle. Please let me find that chair, I thought. Let me shrink into the proverbial wallpaper. No, no, saying something I did not understand to the man beside me, he asked me to remain, to sit down, and he pulled out the chair there for me. It was the lone chair at that table. We have come here, the elder elder began, because we have told you what we know. Many of us here do not come out, so they don't know who we are, who our medicine people are. 
They do not know we are still here. We have all come here today because it is time for you to tell us what you know. Please tell us. We need to hear from you. We need to know. I stood there looking around, not knowing who would even understand me speaking in English. All the young helpers who had been fetching coffee and making their elders comfortable looked more confused than me. My eyes then caught those of the elder elder and she nodded, so I sat down. So began my sharing. It was a very long day. I offered to stop many times, but they kept wanting more. This telling me what they carried had been an intense course of study in law for me, indigenous law, made even more intimate by their also sharing their stories so tragic and horrendous they had not shared with anyone before. The learning included new ways of knowing. I was to carry things for a time and to add to the knowledge what happened, was happening, and would be happening, and why. I felt bad many an evening when a son or other relation was made to wait for hours in the car because something was for me to hear and not them, only then to have to drive the distance back to their elders' home. At night, especially after our talks, it was as if hundreds more came calling to do their data dump. I remember crying out one sleep time, slow down, I am not a computer, I'm only human. My head hurts already. And they did with an apology. But that was disrespectful of me to interrupt like that, to complain, I later understood. I was accorded great patience for which I am most grateful. My West Bank gig ended in 1994. I wrote Trick or Treaty in 1996, formal title, BC Treaty Process, Trick or Treaty, giving effect to the spirit and intent of treaties, abandoning treaty rights. And I wrote my book, Gustafson Lake Under Siege, and it was published in early 1997. I still cringe at the book's need for a final edit, but time was too tight. It needed to get out before the trial ended. The Gustafson Lake standoff ended after I agreed to represent those who were there for and still there after the last cycle of a Sundance, pledged and with a petition for help to white buffalo calf woman. My clients had slipped through the armed containment, as they regularly did, they told me, to ask me in person in Kamloops, British Columbia. I was living on Beach Avenue in Peachland, British Columbia. Having to leave there later was very hard, as it is a gorgeous location on Okanagan Lake. My young son was absolutely heartbroken, but my missing of the home changed once I was asked, hey, didn't you ever wonder why no Indians live there? It is their burial grounds. It was not unusual to just meet people at a reserve gas station and follow to a meeting place, but I was surprised to be meeting people I had been hearing about as being elsewhere, surrounded by weapons in the bush. The RCMP operation was the most expensive of its kind in Canadian history, estimated at $5.5 million and involved 400 officers supported by the military in Operation Wallaby. Quote, the military provided the Bison Armored Personnel Carriers, APCs, drivers for the APCs and crew commanders. There were at least a total of nine APCs used at Gustafson Lake. Minister of Defense, Mr. Douglas Young, states that the Army was not authorized to perform in a confront confrontational capacity. Evidence indicates that an armored personnel carrier was used in an operation to disable a red truck by exploding a device underneath it while it traveled along the road. The plan called for the APC to ram the red truck when the explosive device was set off. This has been captured on videotape and is referred to as the September 11 red truck incident. I enclose a copy of the operational plan. The drivers and crew commanders of the APCs were equipped with C7 rifles and sidearms, technical information enclosed. During the battle on September 11, 1995, RCMP semi-automatic M16s became jammed and the RCMP borrowed Army issue C7 automatic weapons to fire at the camp occupants. Evidence indicates that the RCMP fired thousands of rounds into the bush and top-ranking RCMP personnel have not disagreed with the figure of 10,000 to 20,000 rounds. Army figures indicate that at least 2,800 rounds for M16s and C7s, they use the same ammunition, were charged to the RCMP. 
The type and amount of ammunition brought to Gustafson Lake by the military is attached and includes cartridges of 5.56 millimeter ball, 5.56 millimeter tracer, 9 millimeter ball, various types of hand grenades, comet flares, and flare surface trip devices. This is a February 4th, 1997 letter from Tibetan Defender's lawyer Manuel Azevedo to the Member of Parliament for Esquimalt, Juan de Fuca, Dr. Keith Martin. It has been estimated that actually 77,000 rounds were used. Hard to forget the sight of all those trees cut down by ammunition. Standing there, I realized the level was at my nose. They had been crouched down below as it exploded all around them. A scene from Predator, 1987, when they unloaded on the tropical trees came to mind, only this was no movie set. After our meeting, they slipped back into camp and formally came out the next day, September 17, 1995. When I asked how they did it, going back and forth through all that, including avoiding the low-flying helicopters, I came to better understand what it means to know and be of the land. It is the stuff that scared newcomers that led to all that heathen nonsense. It was quite the ultimatum I was given. If I would not act, they were going in for the long haul, they said. So despite my son and I having been almost killed but pretty banged up hard as passengers in an intentional single car accident and still recovering, I agreed to act. Though damaged, my son and I had survived and other lives were now at stake. The green light order had been given. I would later read in discoveries and injuries had already occurred. My injuries, however, prevented me from continuing on the criminal trial that began on July 8, 1996, in British Columbia's most secure courtroom, a special floor-to-ceiling bulletproof courtroom in Surrey, B.C. The trial proper being 10 months, but with sentencing lasting to more than 13 months, this was at the time the longest and most complex criminal trial in Canadian history. One young indigenous man on trial accused me of having been bought off when I stepped down. He came to understand once my book was published. He felt really bad about his accusations and how he had spoken to me, especially in front of the others, which he had ended by turning his back to me. I actually had earlier been offered a master's degree and or academic position or anything else I might have wanted to stand down and curtail my involvement to not act as trial lawyer. Oh, just write a paper or something. We will pay you well to do some research. We will give you your master's degree for it. Research on what? What, I asked. Curious how far this would go. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want. Saying if I refused, they would not approve my fees and expenses to represent the defendants through legal aid. I had refused to act on that combination offer threat and disclosed it to my clients and continued to act, even though I would not be paid. But I worked to get a team of lawyers in place. They would not be able to refuse to pay every regular criminal defense lawyer, nor would they find those lawyers to be of such a threat to warrant the risk of dealing with them as the province did me. But when the pain just proved too much for me, that exchange did give me the idea. I could contribute by getting on the record that which I knew would not be allowed on the record in the courts. I had already had extensive direct experience with the lengths to which the Canadian political, economic, and legal systems would go to stop my efforts for Indigenous nations. I share that another time. So I wrote the book. That was not the last time I was contacted and stepped in to prevent escalations and violence. And the prospect of breach of the peace by Crown breach of treaty or through, provocati or through provocation by Crown agents of Indigenous people. My contributions, for the most part, have remained very private to the general public and pro bono without payment. Indeed, at my expense, the cost to me and mine has been steep. I am a peacekeeper, a helper of nations, warning, reminding, explaining, sharing. I'm also called Sheds the Light and have other names in different languages. Some just call me names. It seems my contributions may have interrupted their personal plans. I am likened to or talked about in relation to inter alia, among other things, a mother grizzly bear, a north wind, a certain buffalo calf, a tick. I had to ask. When she grabs onto an issue, there is just no shaking her. She digs in deeper when you try to get her off. Some kind of white medicine woman, that blonde in my dreams. 
that one being a personal favorite, because of the elder and his family who told me, everything is going to be okay now. She came. I told you she would come. I can die any time now, a happy man, the elder told his wife, who then told me after I left their house. His whole family and the other guests had come streaming out of the home to stop me as I was backing out the driveway. His wife had been so upset by her husband's dreaming about having an affair with some blonde, so she thought. For decades, he kept repeating, someday a beautiful blonde woman would be with him in his home. Not the crazy old fool his wife used to respond with, she said. So, you're the white angel they talk about, a Department of Justice lawyer leaned in, sized me up, and not impressed, sarcastically shared. It was news to me, I'd never heard that kind of talk. His eyes bugged out as he went flying back in his chair, and it tipped over when I refused the offers. I had already made my commitment in a longhouse, among nations, the ancestors of four directions. Ask around, then, if that helps you consider what I now share. And if you do... You just don't know what to think. Have me come round and you can eyeball me. I may even have something personal for you.